I'm excited to present this information to you and um, talk about an interesting topic in dementia and how it relates to your eyes. So <clears throat> we hear a lot about this word dementia, um, especially in America now. And it, does anybody here have any ideas what dementia is? Alzheimer's, right. That's, the two are almost synonymous. So when you hear Alzheimer's and dementia, you think those two are related. Um, but dementia is really a description of the symptoms of the neurodegenerative diseases that cause a change to your brain function. Lewy body dementia, you've heard about as well. That is very common with Parkinson's. With Parkinson's disease, you start with the pill rolling tremor and you start with um, the movement issues, but with Lewy body disease, the dementia starts first. So the two are connected. Uh, when you've heard of Parkinson's disease before, Lewy body disease, the dementia comes first. So they're almost the same mechanism, but basically with Lewy body, your first symptoms are the cognitive problems. You might lose things, you might have trouble um, forming your thoughts or making plans. Uh, with Parkinson's disease, you get the tremor and then later on you get the dementia sometimes with Parkinson's. <clears throat> so frontotemporal dementia um, is maybe 5 to 10 percent of overall the type of primary dimensions there are and that affects the front part of the brain. Secondary dementias happen when um, you develop a neurodegenerative disease that causes another problem with your body. So with Parkinson's it's a pill rolling tremor, um, with Huntington's disease, it's jerky movements, and this is sort of a genetic problem. With Wernicke-Korsakoff, you might have heard of that. That's a problem with actually a vitamin deficiency. Um, so thiamine, you're deficient in thiamine, and that causes sometimes many problems with the eyes, but neurologic problems. So people who have that primarily can then secondarily go on to develop dementia. Traumatic brain injuries, when you're in an accident or when your brain undergoes trauma, those type of patients can then develop dementia afterwards. And then amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, which is Lou Gehrig's disease. So we're all kind of familiar. These are diseases that you are diagnosed with initially that can lead to dementia. So all these things, and this is sort of like a little um, pie-shaped chart that gives a breakdown here. So Alzheimer's is the large, vascular is the second most common, Lewy body, which is common with Parkinson's, frontotemporal, and then all the secondary and mixed mechanisms. So that's kind of the distribution of uh, the disease, diseases that cause dementia. So I put this slide up here. I found this on Google. This was a Google search, but it, it kind of gives a breakdown of the types of things that we think about with dementia. And, and these are very common with Alzheimer's. Alzheimer's has a, a number of stages. So in the in the early stages of the disease, patients with Alzheimer's may have problems with forgetting a name that they learned that day, or maybe, where did I put my keys earlier? I can't find my keys. So those are the kind of early symptoms of Alzheimer's. In the middle stage, you start to lose important memories, like, where do I live? Where did I grow up? What is my phone number? That's characteristic of the middle stages, along with the things like sleep problems, so sleep cycles start to get disrupted. Um, planning starts to get disrupted. Some of your higher level functioning. And then tertiary or, or late stage Alzheimer's is where you need extra care. So somebody to help you eat, somebody to help you communicate, somebody to help you to do uh, higher functioning things. So that's how sort of the characteristics of Alzheimer's. How does it happen? How does Alzheimer's really happen? And this is our current understanding. Um, <clears throat> in the brain, there are neurons, and the neurons send messages to each other, and that's how our brain tells us to do things. That's how we talk, that's how we hear, that's how we plan, that's how we remember things. With Alzheimer's, the first thing that starts to develop is a plaque, and these are called amyloid beta plaques, and they develop between the cells. And then later on, the cells themselves become irregular. So you get these tangles um, of neurons and they are characterized by this protein called tau protein. So amyloid beta plaques and tau proteins, those are the, the big contributors. So this disease is differentiated from uh, Alzheimer's that way. <clears throat> Some of the treatments are similar. 
other than the fact that you've got to address the underlying vascular disease. Um, but the treatments are kind of like the treatments we give for Alzheimer's. Uh, Lewy body is kind of unique to the eye. These patients sometimes can have visual hallucinations. So there's a um, condition that some people get when they've lost a lot of uh, vision, when, they're, when they sort of have blindness, where they project and they start to think they see things, like somebody with advanced macular degeneration or somebody with advanced glaucoma might say, I'm seeing something here. These patients have good vision, they can see very well, and they hallucinate. So those patients are differentiated that way for me as an eye doctor. Um, but they start to have sleep issues. And again, there's a lot of overlap with these diseases. Um, and muscle rigidity is a big one. But Lewy bodies, also similar. They build up in the nerves, in the neurologic tissue, and they're characterized by this different protein. So frontotemporal dementia um, is a, is an alarming one because it changes our personality. This part of the brain, the frontal part of the brain, is where we, you know, sort of where our personality is shaped. Uh, it changes our moods and whatnot. Come on in. How you doing? Okay. So we're just describing the different types of neurodegenerative diseases that cause dementia. So right now, we're through the primary types, and we're talking about frontotemporal. So that part of the brain, the frontal part of the brain, um, sort of causes us to have emotion and sort of causes us to have our moods and, and how people characterize us as people. So that type of dementia um, is problematic and it can be disturbing. And some of the things that are noticed early on with that type of dementia um, are our speech centers are affected, um, difficulty with facial expressions. And um, so all of these diseases that cause dementia, they all are, have a lot in common, but they're all just a little bit different. So you can imagine, if I was a neurologist, or if I was your primary care doctor who's seeing you all the time, and I started to detect these changes, or your family member came in with you and said, you know, something's not quite right. You know, you're doing this or that different. Let's go to the doctor and get that checked. It's really difficult to figure out which one of these diseases is affecting the patient. So the diagnosis of these problems uh, has been an area of big research. So right now, apart from the clinical things that we just talked about, like the characteristics and the symptoms and, and the problems that people start to develop with these, that, in addition to these expensive tests, are how we diagnose people with these diseases. The only true way to know if you actually have Alzheimer's is after you've passed, there's, they do a biopsy. That's the only true way to know. But the best we can do for our patients now is imaging. So MRIs, CT scans, um, what's called a PET scan. Has anybody ever heard of a PET scan before? So a PET scan differentiates from an MRI or a structure scan in that it tells us the activity of the brain. So the parts of the brain that are affected with dementia start to have less metabolism and less activity. And um, so that's one of the tests that doctors use. MRIs show structure, so they're going to show us the brain tissue, they'll show us if the brain is atrophying or shrinking, but now you've got two scans and they're expensive. So we're always looking for ways to find these problems at a less, less of an expense on the medical system and the health system, um, but specifically something that's unique and characteristic to each disease. And that's where all the research is going. So we talked about the uh, amyloid beta, we talked about the um, tau proteins, and we talked about the alpha synuclein protein. Those are things that we're trying to gear our imaging to find, because guess what? In the eye, this is where we're going to transfer to the eye today, the eye is really just an extension of your brain. So if we know those chemicals and proteins are starting to change in the brain, they're probably changing in your retina and in your eye as well. So Sleep cycles, we talked a little bit about becoming worse, are directly connected to the eye. And this is where we kind of say, well, how, does, how do all those diseases we just learned about connect to what we see in an eye exam? And this is kind of the exciting part for me. So sleep dysfunction in dementia occurs early. And there's been a lot of research in the past 10 years in the retina. And the cells in the retina, you think rods and cones and photoreceptors, right? 
Well, they've started to really specify each different type of cell. Um, <clears throat> The cells in the retina are directly connected to our sleep centers, and they think that that's a big key uh, for research. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about that. <clears throat> so you remember in science class learning about rods and cones, and there's really about 120 million rods, and there's about six million cones, and the cones are what give you that real sensitive central you know, the color vision and the night vision is for the rods. You guys remember learning all that stuff, right? Well, there are these other photoreceptors they found that are different from those. And they're called intrinsically photosensitive retinal ganglion cells. So the retinal ganglion cells are typically cells that connect these photoreceptors directly to the brain. They're like extension cords. So they plug into the photoreceptors and the cord runs all the way to the brain and synapses or connects with another part of the brain. <clears throat> okay. These cells actually sense light. They're the only cells in the ganglion layer or the inner layer of the retina that sense light. And they found that there's only about 5,000 of them. So think about that, 120 million, 6 million, 5,000. There's not many. Um, so these are small cells. And they synapse directly with our sleep center. So that's why I put the sleep slide on there. So these cells, they found, connect directly to what gives us our circadian rhythm. When do you go to sleep? When do you wake up? And they, in particular, sense blue light. So blue light, there's all this talk about blue light and computers and screens and blue light's so bad for you. Well, blue light's actually pretty good for you during the day. You want to get blue light during the daytime because that is what signals our brain to be awake and alert. But at nighttime, after we're at home, you don't want blue light. So that's why they've developed the blue filters for the glasses. It's good to wear those glasses in the evening when you're on a screen because you get blue light from our screens now and our phones. <clears throat> um, these cells are also connected to our pupil response, which we'll talk about. So the pupils, uh, you know, when you shine a light, these cells connect to a nucleus in the brain that sends an impulse right back to the iris to constrict. So they do two things. They control, we know they're connected to sleep and we know they're connected to our pupils in some way. This slide kind of describes what I was talking about. It's a little technical, but light comes in, specifically we're talking about blue light, hits our eye and our retina, goes, this is the sleep center, the suprachiasmatic nucleus, big long fancy term for like an internal clock. And that, nucleus connects to the pineal gland. The pineal gland releases melatonin. So at nighttime, a long time ago, uh, there were no electricity, there was no electricity, there were no lights, there were no screens. And when lights went out, message sent to the pineal gland, melatonin was released, it's time for bed, your body got ready for sleep. Um, well, they're finding that the things we do nowadays with technology and screens disrupts those circadian rhythms. So this whole pathway is a big area of research. On top of that, the same exact pathway goes and does the sleep, which we just talked about, but it also connects to other parts of the thalamic system, which control our emotions and our moods and our alertness and kind of how we are during the day. So they think that this is directly related to Alzheimer's and dementia. So that's kind of how the eyes link to all this. Now, <clears throat> finding out exactly how all that is connected and what came first, the chicken or the egg, did the atrophy of the, the retinal cells happen first or did the deposit of the protein from the Alzheimer's happen first? That's all things that they're still researching. So again, Alzheimer's and dementia and the different diseases that cause dementia are a huge concern for us as Americans. Um, it really is, I think the statistic I had earlier is 10% of patients older than 70 now have dementia in America. And they project that by the time 2030 comes around, it's about six to seven million now, it could be upwards of nine to 10 million. So that number is getting bigger. So we wanna find ways that we can test for it that are inexpensive. And we, obviously we wanna find treatments that work. So those are two big areas of research. When I look at your eye, 
One of the pieces of equipment I use is called an OCT. That's what we call it in the eye world. It stands for Ocular Coherence Tomography. Uh, we talked about that earlier. So that technology gives us a number of different pieces of information about your eye, most of which is related to glaucoma and macular degeneration. That's, that's where we've sunk all of the research and technology in there with this equipment. But the smart scientists that look at this stuff have also determined that with Alzheimer's, remember, that inner layer of ganglion cells starts to become thinner. With other types of dementia, the outer layers become thinner. But for the big one, Alzheimer's, the inner layers become thinner. And that is something that we can test for. So this is an eye where everything else had looked fine to me. The optic nerve looked fine, the eye looked healthy, the retina looked healthy. And we were just doing a routine screening and this patient had significant retinal thinning in both eyes. <clears throat> so I look at that as an eye doctor and I say, well, what could the list be that causes that? And the list is pretty long. You cannot look at this one test and say, this patient has Alzheimer's or dementia, but it's certainly on my list of differentials. And as time goes on, this technology is gonna improve and it will test for other things other than just the thickness. This is a test that's associated with the OCT that looks at the blood vessels. So this central dark area is the fovea. That's where the focal point is. When light comes into the eye, that's where all of your cones are concentrated right here. It gives us our best vision. Uh, that's the area that's affected with macular degeneration. And a lot of this testing is really important for diabetes with swelling and macular degeneration with leaking in these vessels. Um, but in this case, they found, the researchers, again, they look at this stuff, this small spot gets bigger, this avascular area where there's no blood vessels gets bigger with Alzheimer's. So that's an area they're looking at. So this technology is inexpensive to do, and it can give us a volume of information about your eye. And I'm gonna do this for my patients on a regular basis anyways, but at some point, and it's not quite there yet, maybe within the next three to four years, it might give us the key to unlock dementia and the different types of neurodegenerative diseases that cause dementia. I talked about the pupil. Remember that whole pathway from the retina to the pupil reflex? Those same cells that are affected with Alzheimer's connect to the pupil. And they've found, they've done research, this is a pupillometer, so this measures the velocity at which your pupil constricts and then redilates. And that blue light in particular causes like a tonic resting tone to the pupil and all that's looked at. And there's a definitely a correlation between uh, pupil response and um, people with Alzheimer's. So there's a direct, almost a one-to-one -one correlation. So they're looking at that as a way, and this might be a screening for dementia at some point. It's just not there yet. It's not diagnostic. The only way we can use these right now is an ancillary test, like an extra test from the clinical signs and the MRIs and the PET scans and the analysis for the protein in the cerebrospinal fluid. All those tests which are diagnostic or, you know, you look at the big picture. This is just one more test that can be used. I put this slide on here because everybody thinks about cataract surgery. That's a common problem that everybody is affected by. And now that you have that understanding about those special cells in the eye, this big study just was, I think it was 2021, and it had 5,000 patients that they looked at. There was a 30% reduction in the risk for developing dementia for those patients who had cataract surgery. And they're not 100% on why exactly that happens, but we think it's related to that system. The lens, when it becomes clouded, starts to look yellow. If you've ever seen a cataract, it's, it's almost like an amber color. And we all know about colors and filters. When you wear yellow sunglasses, it filters blue light. Well, this is like having, when you have a cataract, it's like having a permanent blue light filter. And there's actually studies that say when you have cataract surgery, you live a little bit longer. So that is all extra gravy on the food, icing on the cake. 
uh, for thinking about cataract surgery. But as it relates to our talk today, I just thought that was very interesting. And this um, is an area of research that they're gonna be looking at more. So what do you do? You know, we have all these treatments that we talked about which are helping the symptoms, but they're not fixing the problem, right? There, there hopefully will be treatments very soon that address these diseases because they're obviously devastating. But what we know about the neurologic system and our general health in America is that these uh, things that I've listed on the slide, which we'll go through, are a big uh, factor in limiting your risk for developing dementia. So our focus at MOA is always total health and lifestyle modifications. What can I do to prevent the disease from getting worse? <clears throat> and a lot of the research I read pointed to our glycemic index. In America, our glycemic index is really high because we like uh, baked goods. We like bread, we like pizza, we like cookies, we like refined sugars. All of those things lead to a higher glycemic index. Insulin resistance, central obesity, all of those things drive, uh, all that food that we eat drives those problems. So I talk to my patients about modifying that. Um, cut those things out or cut them down to as little as you can. If you have a family history of dementia uh, or Alzheimer's, these are things you wanna be thinking about. While you're cutting those things down that we all love, and we can still eat them, but just not as much, um, you wanna think about intaking other things that are good for you. So antioxidants, I always say leafy greens, dark berries are good for the retina and the brain, so antioxidants. Omega-3s we harp on uh, are anti-inflammatory. Flavonoids you get from berries, strawberries, you wanna make sure you're eating plenty of fruits. And this is a big one, curcumin uh, or turmeric. Um, I was talking about this earlier with Cheryl. Um, that is anti-inflammatory and it's been studied a lot in the neurologic system and that is protective in some studies. So those are things I talk about. The Mediterranean diet, you hear all about that, but basically low carbs, proteins that are better for you. We eat so many, such a quantity of beef and pork and chicken. I do too. But if you can start to change those habits and incorporate more fish and limit your intake there, that is the crux of what is happening with these diseases. All of these neurodegenerative diseases, patients have higher glycemic index. It creates oxidative stress on the neurologic system and these cells start to break down. Um, walnuts obviously are good. Exercise and calorie restriction. Exercise is the big one. Just go out for a walk. Go out for a walk a couple times a week. Um, that counts, taking an hour long walk. Absolutely no smoking. Smoking is horrible for your retina. Uh, it's very bad for your whole body in general, but there's been, every study that's been ever done has tied this to a problem, especially with the neurologic system, and then reduce alcohol intake. So those, you can do that now. If you've got a family history, start making those changes because that is really going to fix the problem. So the treatments we have are fixing your symptoms. This is gonna reverse the problems that are developing at that cellular level. And that's what I talk about with my patients. I think that's it. That's my family. Then, There's why. <laughs> yeah, less, right, stress. Yeah. Stress yes. is a big, yes, de-stress. Um, did you all have any questions? Is there any correlation between uh, PMR? And There's a direct correlation to your eyes and the, and the significant blinding diseases that can happen with your eyes. But any autoimmune disease, um, the things we talked about today, inflammation in the body, a lot of it is connected to our diet and our level of exercise and activity. And um, so in that regard... Yes, they're probably related to some degree, but no direct connection that I know of. Um, so with PMR, you know, patients get inflammation along their shoulders and some of the inflammation that occurs there, uh, we share in common with this condition called giant cell arteritis. So giant cell is a huge concern for eye doctors because it is a condition that affects 
the artery that supplies the eye. And um, I believe it's 30% of patients that have PMR also can have that condition called giant cell. So whenever I see a patient who has had a history of giant cell or a history of polymyalgia, I always look at their medicines and I say, what are you taking? Are you seeing a rheumatologist? Because those are usually lifelong problems. Like if you've had inflammation at some point, you treat it and you get it under control, but those numbers need to be watched. Um, the thing that it causes with the eye when you have giant cell, there's an artery that supplies the retina, which we learned about today. And um, that artery and the art, smaller arteries that supply the optic nerve get ischemic and it causes an arteritis. So that um, causes a dramatic loss of vision. It can happen overnight. So whenever we see any symptoms, and the symptoms with giant cell are a little different than polymyalgia, but um, jaw pain, hairline pain, you know, people are losing weight, night sweats, these kind of symptoms go along with that problem. Uh, and again, polymyalgia usually is like pain along your shoulders and back pain. And I always ask about that too. But so the, that condition is directly connected to the eye. So that's a concern for me. But as it relates to Alzheimer's, I don't know of any direct connection, but in the basis of inflammatory disease, I'm sure there is some connection and there may be that I just don't know about. What about optic neuritis? Good question, yes. So optic neuritis um, is a condition that a lot of times we connect directly to uh, multiple sclerosis, um, but optic neuritis and inflammation of the optic nerve can happen for a number of different reasons. Um, as far as its connection to Alzheimer's, um, the one slide in here that I had uh, talked about Wernicke-Korsakoff. People with Wernicke-Korsakoff and thiamine deficiency, they get optic neuritis. So that's one of the presenting problems there, but not so much with Alzheimer's, I don't think. My first sister, who is 83 years old, mm -hmm. Last year she started to forget so forgetful and so doctor diagnosed to not have a dementia, forgetfulness. Now she called my sister, she said so she didn't think she called ten times. Oh wow. And so then, she forgot she called. She yeah, kept calling. Okay. And then lost the direction, something like that. So it looks like and the doctor said her brain is really shrink. So it sounds like a, a dementia about why my she said, doctor said, just forget from this. Which yeah, so true. probably, I don't know, I've never reviewed her case yeah. in particular, but there, all of these diseases we talked about cause that atrophy. So it could be one of those diseases. Remember, the diseases lead to the dementia. So her symptoms are dementia, but um, it could be that she has one of those problems. <clears throat> Brain is really shrink. I Atrophy about. happens with all these diseases. So, you know, you think of the skull, you've seen the x-rays. The brain usually fills the whole inside of the skull with, mm -hmm. I didn't put a slide on there, but um, with Alzheimer's and the other diseases, the brain will atrophy and shrink so that the skull's out here and the brain is smaller within the skull. So that's what the imaging shows. It can show that atrophy. <clears throat> family history, no one had a heart attack, cancer, or, or dementia. But right now, my sister has, my sister has cancer, stomach has before, now eye problem. And most Koreans, most concern is that cancer and dementia. Sure. That worries. Yeah. I honestly worry about dementia because I've seen family members have it and it's concerning, you know. Yeah, it's concerning. Um, you know, we forget something and we think, oh, is that a problem? But, you know, it's... Uh, <laughs> It's so common, and um, you know what I've learned just preparing for this talk today uh, is really, right now, it should be proactive in our health and our exercise and our and our diet. That's what we know so far. You know, the treatments obviously we don't want to have those diseases develop, but they are. And one thing I didn't say in some of these slides, which I kind of wanted to point to, is <clears throat> these diseases usually take about five to eight years to sort of set in. So when you have it. I didn't really give you the timing. Alzheimer's and some of the common diseases are usually like an eight-year time frame. Some of them are faster, like uh, Lou Gehrig's disease happens quickly within like three or four years usually. Um, Did you see the FDA uh, approved a drug for 
for um, ALS yeah. today. I didn't see that. Yep. And it has a very small group study. It is, and it's and it and then there's a lot of challenges with the study. But it, but to Dr. Cook's point, it's so aggressive that the FDA felt it was just worth the risk because of the to aggressiveness. To give people hope, and, yeah. Mm -hmm. yep. mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, I know with that, there's a lot of yep. investigation into genes and the the genetic link. There's certain types that if you have the gene, it's a much more aggressive type. So they're looking at all that. Having uh, problems with retina, like uh, making hole, the tone, yeah. and the cotton hole, like that, that means uh, retina is uh, thick, thin. Thin, thin. yeah. So that means uh, retina is thin. Typically, people who are prone to holes and tears, mm -hmm. uh, their eyes have a longer axial length. So if this was the front and this is the retina, mm -hmm. the eye is longer genetically. Yeah. And the retina, remember, is back here. So the equator where the retina attaches, because it's longer, gets thin in that area. So a nearsighted patient or people that are very nearsighted, yeah, sure. more than a minus six, yeah. like people higher than minus six, they are the ones that are at risk for retinal detachments, yeah. retinal tears, yeah. retinal holes. Yeah. Retinal holes happen naturally sometimes, and they don't always need to be fixed. But tears always need to be treated. <clears throat> that means the retina is thin? Usually. Not always. I mean, not sometimes always. people who are farsighted that get tears. But a thin retina usually happens in a nearsighted eye. Oh. So. so you can tell me... The major, how thin my retina, you can say that? Maybe when I look at your eye, when I examine your eye, um, you can say that. we have equipment here that can tell you your axial length, can tell you how long your eye is. Mm -hmm. um, but when I look at it, sometimes there's characteristics in the peripheral retina that look like thinning. That's called lattice degeneration. Mm -hmm. So we look for that in, in our eye exam. Sometimes we can see that, but not always. So if your retina was long and it looked healthy, I wouldn't know if it was thin or not. Uh, I have a nearsighted. You're nearsighted? Yeah, you saw it the other day? Yeah. Six. Well, we checked your vision. I'm sure I would have told you if there was a problem. What I remember, you're seeing great, young yeah. <laughs> At what point um, have you been told you have a cataract? And it just, it's not an extensive. So at what point would you consider like the surgery? Good question. So those two things I talked about earlier, that's in my mind how I refer people. It's your visual acuity. So, you know, we say, well, what vision do I see? Well, I'm 2020. That means you're seeing a appropriate size letter for 20 feet. So that's the 20 foot letter for a 20 foot test distance. If you're seeing 2030, you're seeing the 30 foot letter and you're having to move it into 20 feet. So you're seeing what most people can see out at 30 feet, but you're having to pull it all the way up to 20 feet to tell what it says. That's how we gauge our vision, 20, 20, 20, 25, 20, 30. So my cutoff for vision is usually 20, 30 for cataracts, as long as there's symptoms. So your symptoms, you would come in and say, I'm, I'm blurry now and uh, I can't drive at night because there's starbursts, and I can't see road signs when I'm, I need to turn. I'm missing the turn. Um, those are all clues to me that you're having problems. And we try to fix that. We try to give you a new prescription for glasses. And then if the glasses do not make you better than 20, 30, that's usually like the ballpark number. Now, some people can come in and have horrible symptoms and be 20, 20 or 20, 25. And I say, oh, it's a cataract, in which case you could still have surgery. There's not a hard and fast rule. But the most important part is your symptoms. If, if I tell you to have a surgery uh, and then you go and have a surgery and you're not 1000% happy, then you're gonna be upset. So that you always wanna make sure there's a reason to have any surgery. And that's how I, that's how I guide my patients. <clears throat> Anybody else have any questions? Well, this was so much fun. Thank you for coming out. Did you guys learn something today? Yeah. All right, awesome. Yeah. I'm glad you came out. I, I never see this on social media. Yeah. <laughs> and now we're going to serve healthy cookies. Yeah, right? <laughs> we're going to crank that glycemic index up. Yeah. <laughs>